exactly what the founding fathers of ASEAN wanted. They wanted a region of peace that contributes to the economic well-being and social mm. well-being of people, which is exactly what ASEAN communities are today. Mm -hmm. So in essence, uh, we are returning to the original purpose of ASEAN, which is really people to people, rather than merely business to business or government to government, which makes for the elite uh, description that you suggested. So do you think that Indeed, there could be sep separate tracks of developing ASEAN consciousness and identity so that while governments talk and then businesses try to trade and invest with each other, now the people like your bird singing groups <laughs> facilitate more exchange. I think a, a key, key role has to do with uh, the role of the civil society. And uh, until recently and even now, <clears throat> The ASEAN intergovernmental process and the ASEAN cooperation at the NGO level uh, has not really intersected. A uh, lot of NGOs in ASEAN uh, see ASEAN as a challenge to threat to them. They, they don't like when uh, ASEAN develops a charter or a policy and doesn't consult them. Uh, they are always critical of uh, human rights and uh, human rights policies of ASEAN governments. Although there is an intergovernmental commission on human rights in ASEAN, it doesn't really have investigative powers. It's, uh, it's basically a uh, body that organizes seminars and conferences. It doesn't have uh, protection functions. And NGOs in ASEAN are very happy about that. Uh, and uh, so the civil society increasingly is networking among itself, but it's not talking to the governments in the way it should. Uh, and uh, that has to change. To have a real people's ASEAN, you have to really have the civil society reach out, not only among itself, but also have a place in the ASEAN framework. But I'm also talking about, yes, unity in diversity is important. I mean, in, in, in ASEAN is, as I said, beginning, it's the most diverse group of people in the world in terms of religion, ethnicity, politics, so political systems, and the like. But I think there's a lot more can be done. Education is another one. I mean, uh, like uh, university curriculums, mm -hmm. uh, having an ASEAN component. I know your uh, AIM uh, has now, you're building ASEAN into all your curriculum. Yes. I mean, not many universities in the region do that. I have been involved in creating institutions in Southeast Asia, in Singapore. We try to do that, but it has to be done a lot more. I can tell you that I go to Europe quite a bit uh, on European Union for, uh, seminars on regionalism. What used to be called international studies in Europe is now called European studies. It's almost dramatic transformation. But the European Union massively funds European studies. So departments that will be called international studies before are now called Department of European and International Studies. So Europeanization has taken over and displaced the study of politics and international relations. We don't see that. How many, I mean, we started when Surin Pichuan was ASEAN Secretary General and I was kind of an informal advisor. He had this idea of uh, ASEAN centers. And I'm, I created one in Washington mm -hmm. with the help of American government. And the US government was excited about this and helped us, and we, we have a thriving ASEAN center for, for the last six years. But how many ASEAN centers we have in uh, Southeast Asia? There's one in Singapore, there's one uh, the recently in Thailand, uh, but uh, many parts of the world, there's no ASEAN study center. Mm -hmm. uh, so that also can change. Education is important because you can train people at the very young stage and create this idea of ASEAN identity. Yeah. In fact, we were trying to grapple with that uh, idea when AIM celebrated ASEAN's uh, founding day last August 8th, we asked how can we make people more aware of ASEAN uh, through this people-to-people -people exchange. We did our research and we found out that the youth especially would identify with a regional cuisine, that's food, mm -hmm. with the music and the arts, that's entertainment, be that music of the West translated into the idiom of the local societies. And that being the case, we know how we should attract the youth. It's through social network and media that are unknown to the founding fathers of ASEAN. Never did the founding fathers think that the youth that will inherit ASEAN might make it more uh, viable if indeed this interaction 
among the young will happen in the areas of culinary, entertainment, and things that the youth love. What's your thought on that? Because you've been in many other groupings around the world studying them. Do you think that this will be a good driver? I mean, when it comes to food, I think having a national identity is good. Uh, I don't think uh, this uh, fusion cuisine, I'm not a big fan, fan, uh, fan of fusion cuisine. It doesn't, I still like to go to Europe and eat Italian food and French food and uh, even English, English food, uh, rather than have European food. Uh, so I think, we, you have fusion cuisine in Singapore, Malaysia, by the way. I mean, mm -hmm. Singapore, Malaysia food is Indian, Chinese, Malay mixed together. Uh, but I think you should keep your own food. But on other things like uh, uh, education, curriculum development, uh, Ambassador Delia was talking about the idea of an ASEAN society, uh, which will be, I hope, more than just uh, officials. Uh, it will be, uh, be cultural. And, uh, and that is a great idea. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, developing ASEAN uh, literary uh, traditions. Uh, which actually there is actually ASEAN Literary Festival, I must say. Yeah. I, 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 I've seen that uh, it's function from time to time. But there's so much more can be done. Recently, uh, late last year, Singapore organized an art festival, a uh, biennial festival, and I actually wrote a, a preface for the catalog. They brought together artists from different parts of ASEAN mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and uh, have a art show, uh, Singapore Art Museum, for six months. And uh, there, and I talked to some of the artists when I was writing this uh, introduction. They didn't know anything about ASEAN. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, why, Professor? I mean, there's nothing about ASEAN that we know. I mean, these are artists from Mindanao, from uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam, from Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tried to create an artificial kind of theme out of very disparate uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, people, these are ordinary people who make a living. These are not big time artists, by the way. Uh, and they don't know about other societies. They are very much embedded in the local context. The other thing is ASEAN also has this problem of uh, periphery. Uh, people who live in the peripheries, who are uh, disorient uh, disenchanted with the government, who like Mindanao, like Southern Thailand, uh, and, uh, and the minorities of Burma, they don't like ASEAN at all. Because uh, they see ASEAN is actually uh, too, through the policy of non-intervention and sovereignty, people of the periphery. Uh, and uh, and uh, some of those artists I dealt, uh, I, uh, came to this, fun, uh, this uh, art festival actually from those regions. I see. And they were not only not, they were hostile to ASEAN. Uh, and a lot of uh, NGOs actually are hostile to ASEAN. Mm -hmm. uh, so ASEAN has been, that's why the people's ASEAN is important. But for the business community also, I really don't know, and I haven't really seen a lot of interest from the business community in ASEAN. Uh, hopefully the ASEAN economic community that will change. When I was uh, working in Singapore, we tried to raise money for uh, research projects from the private sector. Uh, very, not very successful, uh, and uh, because the term ASEAN didn't create interest or enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you have the ASEAN Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I mean, it's not a very, uh, it's not seen as a very effective organization. I'm sorry to say that. It's moribund. Uh, uh, yeah, and the ASEAN Foundation, well, okay, it's very important, but we don't see that as a very effective organization. Uh, so. Those institutions have to be important, not just the ASEAN Secretariat or the ASEAN Foreign Ministers Meeting. Those semi-independent or independent uh, groups, professional groups, mm -hmm. which actually turn, cover several or all the ASEAN countries, straddle the ASEAN countries. They have to create the ASEAN consciousness, and they need help from not only governments, but also from the private sector. Uh, and uh, I hope this ASEAN economic community. And, and the good news is, as I said, the number of people traveling across ASEAN national boundaries has tripled. Uh, and that's very positive news. That means you can actually 
think of a real market. Mm -hmm. And people are going and buying things from different countries uh, within ASEAN. That sort of breaks down the borders. There are a lot mm -hmm. of ASEAN companies, by the way, sorry, companies, small, small companies, which they're not waiting for the ASEAN economic community. They are already going and investing across the border at a small scale, at a small and medium enterprises level. Uh, so that's, we need to encourage that. Very uh, good. I because think ASEAN economic community is a top-down thing. It yeah. basically creates a framework and imposes. Yeah. The bottom-up uh, is important, and that, that's where the business sector and the civil society have to be very okay. important. I'd like to take a pause at this point, because I think uh, the audience must be inundated with uh, ideas and facts, but that's the point. Uh, in today's world, as Mr. Bali was saying, we are VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. All of you swim with facts every day that you ask, what is its relation to my own business or to my own uh, program? Uh, in this regard, I think uh, we have a good chance. Can we take a 10-minute uh, break so that we can distill the thoughts prior to the open forum with the audience? Because we had a good hour discussion. I think we raised the strategic concerns that Philippine business and development communities might be interested in. So may we call for a break? Yes, Professor. So we will have a 10-minute break, and after which we will go back for the open forum. See you. Thank you. Good morning once again. And we're back to understanding ASEAN with Professor Amitav Acharya. And going back to the question, is the ASEAN integration power-seeking, money-making, or community-building? It's now time to hear from our participants, and this is to officially open the open forum. We have microphones set up at the aisles, and we now have one question coming from attorney Michael Toledo from Felix Mining Corporation. Thank you very much, Ace. Uh, good morning, and welcome to Manila, Professor Acharya. I'm glad that you're trying to recover from your jet lag. And of course, uh, good morning to my good friend, uh, Secretary Macaranas. I think you should go back to government soon. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you quite need it. Anyway, uh, Professor Acharya, my question, uh, uh, I would actually have a plethora of questions to ask, but uh, I don't want to monopolize your time, and I don't want to deprive my colleagues as well the opportunity to ask you questions. But before that, perhaps, I, let me just say that to confirm what uh, Professor Macarana said, uh, it is true that in the Philippines, knowledge of ASEAN is really quite limited. But it is not, this is not limited to the Philippines alone. Even in Indonesia, or rather in Singapore, there was a uh, survey that was uh, made. And a majority of the top corporations in, in, in Singapore and its executives were also unaware of ASEAN, unaware of its implications, and even unaware that it's right about uh, coming in 2015 or the start of 2016. Now to my question, uh, Professor, I've been getting conflicting views on, on this particular point. Some people say that the diversity of ASEAN, meaning to say the difference in uh, levels of development, the differences in religion and culture, and the differences in political system is an advantage. But others say that it is a disadvantage. So perhaps mm -hmm. we would like to hear your views on that. And number two, as I said, I limit my questions to just two, would be uh, on ASEAN's relationship with China. Uh, to be more diplomatic about it, I don't want to use uh, bullying. I'm sure Ambassador Delia wouldn't want me to use that word. But China's recent incursions into uh, Philippine territory sovereignty, for example, and in other parts of ASEAN, specifically Vietnam, so far, and let's take the case of Vietnam, for example, when China put a rig inside that territory in Vietnam, ASEAN did not say anything. There was no word, not even a whimper from the ASEAN members. Same thing in the Philippines when they, I did not enumerate the incursions that they have done. And yet there seems to be a muted response on the part of, uh, of ASEAN as a, an association. 
So what should ASEAN do? Should it have a big voice in playing a major role in geopolitics? Like taking a common stand, for example, on this particular issue, aside from economics. Yeah. So just those two points, uh, thank Professor. You. Uh, thank you. Uh, these are very good questions. I, uh, I'm not a real expert. I'm not, a, I'm not from the private sector. So I don't know how well I can answer the question of uh, diversity as a way of uh, how to manage diversity from a business point of view. But uh, you know the, yeah, a, a, from a business point of view, it'll be nice to have a market where everybody has the same taste and you know exactly uh, how to please the consumers. But uh, it's not impossible to devise a strategy that attends to, that, that addresses the problem of diversity, diverse taste. There's a term in, in business lingo, which I also use in political science, called uh, uh, multi-local. Uh, that uh, instead of regional or global, you have uh, a strategy that caters to local tests, but so you become multi-local. You're a corporation with a general strategy, a regional ASEAN strategy, but you also have to have a Vietnam strategy, you have to have a Burma strategy, and in fact, uh, some of the studies of ASEAN economic community that I have seen, there is actually one by, uh, uh, actually it was published in Economist, uh, Economist, not ma the magazine, but Economist uh, con uh, Business Consulting Unit, one of their units, talked about the idea of a multi-local, that uh, you have a regional headquarters, but you should also have uh, specific in uh, innovations and products and variations in that product. Uh, per local market, just like McDonald's, uh, for example, doesn't sell beef in India because it will be uh, <laughs> thrown out immediately, but uh, sells uh, lamb or mutton burgers. Uh, so I think diversity also creates opportunities for innovation uh, that you can actually uh, relate and get ideas from different local contexts. But this is really not my uh, area of expertise uh, and uh, I think what diversity is beautiful and interesting from a social point of view. Um, I like to see a bit of diversity in food and culture. It makes the place more interesting. You know, uh, why do people, tourism is a big industry in uh, Southeast Asia, ASEAN. And people don't come to Southeast Asia just to see one thing. They like to see a bit of a, uh, say, Buddhist culture, uh, like Borobudur uh, or Myanmar temples. They like to see Angkor Wat, which is a Hindu temple. They like to see uh, uh, some of the uh, natural uh, surroundings and beauties, the highlands and the, 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 the beaches. So I think, I think standardization and homogen homogenization uh, for its own sake sometimes can <clears throat> create or stifle creativity. On the second question on China, that's really, of course, the, the single most important challenge facing ASEAN today is China and China's uh, policy in the South China Sea. Now let's look at uh, the positive side first. No ASEAN country agrees with the China's very expansive claim, the nine DAS line. They, nobody except China agrees with that, by the way. The whole world doesn't agree with that. They think it's excessive, it's, uh, it's, it's untenable, it's against international law. So that much consensus is there. Nobody wants conflict or war because of the Spratlys or the South China Sea. They would like to avoid war as much as possible. But there are differences within ASEAN about how to deal with China. And you pointed out rightly that uh, when the Chinese moved the rig, oil rig, to waters claimed by Vietnam, there's no protest. But let me just qualify it in two, uh, with, before we go into that case, let me qualify it with one observation. The Chinese claim to the Paracels is a little different. Their islands were seized by China a little earlier, well before uh, the, Spratly, uh, the South China Sea claim came into limelight. The Chinese feel a little more proprietorial about their claim vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam uh, because of uh, the, the history. I mean, I'm not supporting their claim there, 
but they think they are claimed on Paracels uh, and uh, where the, it's the area where the rig was is a little different. They had that already for some time. And uh, why did ASEAN, ASEAN's response was muted? Because, very simply because, the ASEAN countries still want to give China a chance, a, some sort of a face. And uh, they still want to give it the benefit of the doubt, especially at a time when China and ASEAN are still negotiating with the hope of concluding a code of conduct. We're still at that stage, and actually quite a sensitive stage. So any major open diplomatic confrontation would derail that process. And the other thing is the Chinese did say that this is a temporary move. They are not going to keep the rig forever. They will take it back, and which they did. And the Chinese still did not deploy their navy. They deployed their uh, paramilitary, the, 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 the marine patrol craft, craft rather than navy ships. So the Chinese still are drawing a little line there uh, and not going all the way. Now, if they go all the way, what will happen is that there will be more reaction from ASEAN, and you will find that there will be divisions. I'm sure ASEAN will not speak in one voice, although diplomatically they'll find some language of consensus, but it won't be as uh, stringent and direct in condemning China as possible. But that is ASEAN's problem. I acknowledge that ASEAN does have a problem uh, in not being able to speak in a very strong, united voice. But what I know is that at this point of time, they still think there is a chance to negotiate a code of conduct with China, and they do not want to derail that possibility by openly being confrontational. And that has traditionally been ASEAN's approach. And there are a lot of critiques would uh, say this is, uh, this is just uh, stupidity. And the Chinese are buying, bidding for time, and they will uh, take over, and they're just waiting their opportunity. But I'm not so sure. And there was an absolutely ridiculous article in The Economist reviewing a book uh, on the South China Sea. Uh, and uh, and th it's almost like taking, uh, being, feeling happy that ASEAN looks really bad and, uh, and ASEAN cannot do anything. I don't think a lot of the Western media understands uh, how ASEAN operates. I mean, I read a lot of Western media. I contribute to them. I write for them. When China had a charm offensive in the 90, uh, 2002, I wrote an article in New York Times, you can still find it, said that the charm offensive is not going to last. Uh, and I was right. I, I, I think the Western media jumps into, and I'm so, not just Western media, media also in the region, just jumps into conclusions on the basis of very small developments. I'm not saying that the oil rig incident was not serious, but did anybody point out the fact that this has a different context to it? No. It's just making ASEAN look bad is a favorite sport of a lot of this Western media. And I think The Economist magazine is absolutely ridiculous about that article. And I actually, I might have sent them an email on this. Uh, so they said, oh, ASEAN meetings are boring. All good things, serious negotiations are boring, by the way. Uh, I mean, Ambassador Delia would know. Serious negotiations are not things that you do uh, for fun. Uh, and uh, so I, I would still worry about it. I think ASEAN has to really stay united. And uh, we talk about unity and diversity, but united we stand, divided we fall is very much applicable to ASEAN. But I don't think we have gone to the stage. And the, by the way, a leader needs a follower. If China wants to be a leader in the world, but it has territorial disputes and bad relations with almost every country except North Korea and Laos and, uh, uh, and Cambodia, it's not really going to look much of a leader. Uh, so, 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 so I think the Chinese themselves have to, have to look for regional legitimacy. And, and they, I think one part of the Chinese government is very conscious of that. Uh, the part that I know quite well. Uh, and there is another part which is very nationalistic and think, oh, we will do whatever we want. This was, I mean, you know how ridiculous it sounds when a Chinese uh, military officer in Singapore, the Shangri-La Dialogue said, 
China's claim to sprouts goes back to 2,000 years. Well, in that case, well, what about uh, the Central Asia, the Mughal Empire used to own Pakistan and Bangladesh and uh, Central Asia. We can say the India's claim as a successor to the Mughal Empire goes back to at least 700 years. I mean, that kind of argument doesn't hold. And the other thing that China should be told is that you could claim territory at a certain time on the basis of history, but there is a law now. The international law of the sea is an international rule. And the rule has been created. So, so what was not punishable when there was no law is now punishable under a new rule that China itself assigned to. So you cannot use historical claims when the law has overridden those claims. And uh, I don't think the Chinese would have a very good answer to that. So I'll leave it there, but I would be, I'm concerned, I really think the South China Sea is the single most serious challenge facing ASEAN today. And Philippines is the epicenter of that. Because you were really at the receiving end, without much of a military, uh, and without much of a, I mean, with a very uncertain diplomatic support from some of your member countries. And including, by the way, in some ways from the United States. The United States language on uh, the relevance of the Philippine alliance relative to the Spratlys is, at least the way Obama put it when he visited Philippines, is less definitive than the US commitment to Japan, the way he put it. I think he said ironclad uh, in the case of Philippines, and in the case of Japan, it's like absolutely unexceptionable. Uh, so I, I, can, I can understand this uh, for the in the case of Philippines, why you are worried. And I think it's better, in some ways, it's good to raise these questions and uh, be vigilant. vigilant. Vigilance is the price of liberty, as they say. Uh, always put China on the spot. And uh, I think the Chinese have to make a choice. They want to be a responsible rising power, or they want to be a bully. Thank you, Professor Acharya. Thank you, Attorney Mike. We will hear By the way, we have a slide on the South China yes. Sea, which I'd like to put, uh, and it's uh, number 17. Can you put number 17? It will come up, and you can see, uh, when I see this map, which is coming up, my instant reaction, our instant reaction of most thinking people of the red line, is ridicule. Not uh, respect, not uh, fear, but ridicule. So the nine dash line, which is here, red line. a complete line, the red line, it belongs to China. It goes back to 2,000 years. OK. so. Wait for the next question. Yes. We will hear more from Dr. Acharya and Attorney Toledo in the afternoon session. Now, do we have other questions? You may also address the question to Professor Macaranas. Yes. Yes, we have. Please state your name and your company before presenting your question. Veronica Caparaz from the Asian Institute of Management faculty. Professor Amitav, you don't sound optimistic about ASEAN Economic Community 2015. Based on your sharing this morning, ASEAN is a story of colonization. Do you foresee a story, or, uh, a story of neo-colonization by the new superpowers or the future superpowers, China and India? Hmm. Maybe uh, Professor Makanas, you can <laughs> answer that question. Okay. I, I think we should put the map of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, which is uh, number, number three, ASEAN in Asia, to get a sense of this. Because I don't think 
I say that I should have said if I did, I take it back that ASEAN is a product of neo-colonization. But ASEAN's geography is very important. ASEAN, Southeast Asia, sometimes in the field of Southeast Asian studies, we say it's uh, south of China, east of India, and which is what exactly it is. Uh, and, uh, but it's positive, not negative, because historically, if you go back to the, there was a period in Southeast Asia between uh, 13th, 14th century to uh, 16th century, roughly, we call age of commerce, the age of trade. And Tony Reid, a uh, historian of Southeast Asia, has written a book on this. And basically, trade, so trade thrived here in Southeast Asia, and largely because of the India-China trade. And of course, the, the India-China trade can be stretched to the Middle East, the, at least to the Arabian Peninsula, and the, and the Eastern part can be stretched to Japan. But the core of it was India, China, and Southeast Asia. Now, Southeast Asia benefited. And you can actually go back in history. I mean, really, it's not just even the 10th century, 11th century. It goes back to 4th century AD when we have, since we, uh, then we have actually some archaeological uh, records here. The India-China trade historically benefited Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia can export its spices and act as a transshipment point. Malacca is where the monsoon winds change. The winds change uh, was the transshipment point. And it was uh, Malacca at its prosperity was equal to Venice in terms of trade tonnage. When uh, the Portuguese conqueror came to Malacca and there was a Portuguese uh, traveler called Tomé Pires. He wrote a book, Summa Oriental, and he said in the book that uh, whoever controls Malacca has his hand on the throat of Venice. So Malacca was as significant in the 14th century. And uh, by the way, we often say it's the British and the Americans who introduced free trade. Trade has always been free in the Indian Ocean. Anybody could trade in Malacca, through Malacca, just pay the duty. 4%, 6%, you can trade. Nobody was denied. The only difference was trade in the Roman Empire was safe because Rome had conquered the entire Mediterranean or under the British uh, colonialism, the Britain used to chase the pirates and uh, wipe them out whenever it could to so make trade safe. In the Indian Ocean, and Southeast Asia trade actually was prolific without a hegemon enforcing it. So it was a little unsafe. There were pirates. Uh, but trade was still very significant. So my sense is that Southeast Asia was not colonized in that sense. It was a thriving hub of a very thriving open trading system. And I think, and as the Singaporean form, uh, leaders and George Yeo, the former foreign minister, said it so nicely that when trade is revived between India and China, and it's approaching now $100 billion, Southeast Asia will benefit. Southeast Asia will benefit with the growing trade between Japan and India, uh, or United States and India. So Southeast Asia is, of course, there is a maritime Southeast Asia, there is a continental Southeast Asia, but even those continental nations like Cambodia or Vietnam, they also have maritime frontiers. Southeast Asia thrives on trade, and uh, China thrives on trade, India thrives on trade. A lot of you are business people here. I, I really think Southeast Asia should do well if it can compete, and the competition has to do with uh, policies nothing to do with global trade per se. I mean, there will be global shocks, but I think it's mainly a question of developing infrastructure and education base. Southeast Asia was ahead of China for a long time, by the way, in manufacturing, uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure. Uh, if you have been to China in the 80s uh, and go today, you'll see a vast difference. Southeast Asian manufacturing and infrastructure was better than China's. Uh, but uh, Southeast Asia has to keep doing that. Uh, education is up skilled, skills base is absolutely important. Uh, and uh, I think the ASEAN economic community might be a boost to this. Yeah. Uh, 
to the challenge of Amitav, <laughs> let me say a few words on the question of neocolonization. I think the spirit of Professor Kapara's question goes to the root of your geopolitical argument that ASEAN was founded on political rather than economic mm -hmm. uh, status of uh, nations relationships and therefore we cannot follow the EU model where the economic thrust is greater in its own unification. My take on this is based on what ASEAN can do, as you say, to compete. ASEAN is in a knowledge era. Europe was born out of the industrial age. Therefore, for ASEAN to compete, it must focus really on the new ICT technologies, information communication yeah. technologies. And this is where we feel that it is immaterial for the ICT technologies to be affected uh, more and more by the geopolitical positioning of Southeast Asia uh, through the South China Sea conduit. Uh, I was narrating earlier the concerns of the BPO. Uh, there was a massive conference here, international conference in Manila several years ago that I addressed. And the question was, what is the impact on the BPO industry of the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea struggle? And the point was, maybe not all industries will be affected. Because if you are uh, on the ICT industries, then your value added will be on uh, not shipping of goods and services. In fact, shipping lanes are very important in the old India-China trade. But how about ICT, which does not rely on yeah. value added through shipping? Therefore, if ASEAN focuses on non-shipping lane dependent types of technologies, i.e. in the BPO, uh, where you look at the services rather than the manufactured goods trade, then ASEAN may be at the leading edge of global uh, economic development. And this is where we focus on the youthfulness of ASEAN, because the youth are more attracted to ICT technologies than the older generations. Sure. This will spur the creativity of people in ASEAN to be engaged in uh, the new industry, Sunrise Industries. And therefore, on that count, neocolonization will only happen if indeed we are forever dependent on the technologies of the United States, Europe, and Japan. But increasingly, we have homegrown ICT industries that our own institutions produce. Mm -hmm. Like India was able to do that in the software industry, Maybe ASEAN can do that increasingly. I know that the Malaysian super media corridor did not quite succeed in the way that it was touted to uh, do. But I think the added value today of the diaspora of ASEAN overseas is very critical in the planning stages of countries here in the region for them to be linked to the world of technology. Yeah. And this is not only true of uh, the Philippines, it's true of China and Taiwan, of course, and increasingly many of the overseas people returning to Vietnam uh, and even to Cambodia are highly literate in the new technologies. And in fact, the telecommunications giants in the greater Mekong sub-region are from expatriates. And so given that the new technology basis for growth uh, will be coming from these people, I think neocolonization is bound to happen only if we fall back on the old traditional manufactured goods syndrome of growth. And in the services age, less of that will happen to be manufactured. So the supply chain of ASEAN to the global markets, including those to Korea, Japan, and China, uh, will matter less if we have ICT-dependent industries. Sure. And this is the services age. The International Trade Center in Geneva is closely studying this matter because as we uh, are speaking of new industries, this is precisely where a dynamic young ASEAN can position itself. Europe was born out of the ashes of World War II, and therefore they needed coal and steel. ASEAN was born at the cusp of a new knowledge era. Mm -hmm. And this is where the overseas diaspora and the students studying overseas can make a base for new industries in the, the region. Thank you. Uh, can I have uh, slide number six, please? Number six. Since we go back, to, uh, go back to the old economy, trade, and then come to the new economy, which is IT, uh, I thought it would be interesting for our, our audience to see uh, how the sea lanes still matter 
And uh, okay. Uh, by the way, you may not be able to see what's in the bottom, but it says these sealants are actually in specific to China. China's critical sealants. And China is heavily dependent on critical sealants for its energy imports. Over 80% of China, China's crude oil imports transit through Straits of Malacca. Now, uh, this is energy. Now, no matter how much you transform your economy, uh, you still need energy. And energy is not just for a business or industry, it's also for day-to-day -day living. And uh, this is also related to my earlier point, that if South China Sea is closed, the Chinese say they don't want to uh, interfere with the freedom of navigation, but you know, if they have the control of the South China Sea, they're not to be trusted. Uh, and, but they are shipping, and energy imports comes to the Indian Ocean. Uh, and so I think we will have a kind of a bit of a balance here, that they will be vulnerable in the Indian Ocean too. And I think they, they do realize that. Um, now to go back to the question of uh, modernizing economies, moving beyond manufacturing to services or even more advanced services like IT. I mean, India last week uh, sent an arbiter to Mars for, a, for the first nation to do this on the first attempt. Uh, does it, what does it tell us about Indian economy? The Indian, Indian economy can do some interesting things, although it's not a business venture. It was funded by the Indian government. India does have scientific technological skills, but 38% of Indians still live under less than $1.5 a day which is a well, uh, one of the largest incidences of poverty. So IT sector has done well in India, but I don't think anybody would say it's a substitute for manufacturing. Um, Myanmar, which uh, is opening up, and uh, since uh, two years ago, started thinking of what sort of an economic model uh, it should approach, uh, it should create. So go straight into services, tourism, hotels, and uh, maybe IT, or has to go through resources, which is what it has, natural resources, or do manufacturing. Uh, and those are difficult choices, and I know quite a few people in the, <clears throat> in the, in the economic uh, think tank who are dealing with these questions. I don't think Myanmar can go straight to uh, even services. Uh, it has to have some manufacturing to its comp comparative advantage. So because Singapore can go to services and IT, Malaysia probably can do, Philippines has very strong strengths in IT, but uh, Indonesia, still very resource dependent. A country like Indonesia simply cannot do that, to go into uh, only services or to uh, IT and aerospace, uh, which actually Habibi tried to do, go to aerospace when he was technology minister in the 1980s and was a spectacular failure. Uh, so I, I think manufacturing, trade are not going to, be dis, uh, to disappear for a, for a while yet. So ASEAN is very diverse in economic terms. I mean, let's go back to, I can tell you how diverse ASEAN is by looking at map, uh, sorry, the chart five, the slide number five. Uh, look at ASEAN, just look at the, I can't see that very well, GDP per capita, uh, 2012 in US dollars, uh, Brunei 54,210, Singapore 62,509, but what about, uh, who are the poorest countries? Myanmar, 1,571. Laos, I didn't even know Laos was richer than Myanmar, okay. 2,876, Cambodia 2,528, now, <laughs> You see the huge disparity? I mean, Singapore is what the third richest country in the world now. Uh, and uh, Myanmar must be one of the poorest countries in the world. So to say that ASEAN can have a policy of bypassing in, I'm not an economist, so I'll defer to you. What do you say sounds attractive to me? Okay, and you are the minister, you should be minister again. And uh, I would respect that. But my commonsensical political economy view tells me 
that it's not going to be easy. Also, politically, it won't be easy. You try to tell people, let's all do IT, and your workforce is not educated, uh, and you depend a lot on foreigners. As Singapore has been finding out, it's politically very difficult to bring in a lot of foreigners and let them staff its industry. So, so I think, but manufacturing can employ locals more uh, in that sense. So these transitions will happen in the long-term future, but in the meantime, because of the disparity of ASEAN, I, I, economic disparity, I think we need uh, to still rely on the conventional, some of the conventional economic uh, met methods, including the ones that rely on trade. And uh, there's one other thing I would like to show you. Why was ASEAN founded? Number By eight. the way, ASEAN countries tried building a regional organization under Indian leadership. 1947, ASEAN countries were not independent, but they attended the Asian Relations Conference, which both India and nationalist China attended and trying to lead. And the ASEAN countries, especially Myanmar and others, they said, mm, we, we don't want to be under Indian rule. We didn't give up uh, British rule to be under Indian rule. That's what the delegate of Malaysia, sorry, Myanmar or Burma told uh, to an Indonesian <coughs> counterpart. It's um, actually in my book as well. Uh, China was not acceptable either. And this is where identity comes up. By the way, we know a lot of Southeast Asians have Chinese heritage and a lot of Southeast Asians have Indian heritage, or Indian culture. But they don't want to be like China or India. That's Southeast Asian identity. It's not how many people say they identify with ASEAN. The fact that you don't want to be like China and India is a source of identity. Now, uh, going back to other factors, there was a consensus that many of the governments were authoritarian, and uh, it was kind of a common outlook. You can go to uh, 11, number 11 uh, slide. OK, so what does it look like? Those are the, this is not at the time of the founding of ASEAN 67. This is at the time of the first summit of ASEAN. But uh, you know, kind of Suharto in the middle, uh, dictator. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Marcos is there, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who not a dictator, was leading a democracy, but it's a one-party state. And uh, then, of course, we have uh, Hussein Own of Malaysia, similar to Singapore, Amno dominance, and Kukrit Pramoj, who was prime minister. So Thailand was in the soft military rule at that time. Uh, but the fact that they, uh, they knew each other pretty well, they could uh, talk to each other in the ASEAN way. One of the reasons why ASEAN succeeded is because the leaders knew each other and at an interpersonal level. And they could, uh, not only the heads of states and governments, but also the foreign ministers, they knew each other on a personal basis. And, uh, and they could deal with each other directly uh, without meetings and, uh, and other things. So going back to the Eight, number eight, why was ASEAN founded? Uh, I just wanted to give you the, the broad factors behind ASEAN. Uh, communist rebellions, there was a common threat uh, to ASEAN. Every ASEAN country had a communist party, which is backed by China and the Soviet Union, or China only, uh, against the pro-Western governments. And uh, then there was this resolution of the conflict between Indonesia and Malaysia which helped the, created the impetus for ASEAN. One conflict solved, let's create something that will prevent another conflict like that. Economic factors to me, um, as there was no free trade area plan, still very much dependent on natural resources, and why free trade doesn't grow on natural resource trade. You have to have a different economy to have free trade. And that changed in the 70s and 80s. Uh, economic underdevelopment and transition from colonial economy to industrial economy is more important. Economic nationalism, how to, to make the transition from colonial economy to a self-sufficient economy. Nationalism is more important than interdependence or trade. Uh, so this was a very different ASEAN, but this was some of the founding motivations. Uh, some of it has disappeared, some of it is still important. Uh, I think ASEAN still doesn't want to be an appendix to India and China. Uh, I think that desire is very strong in Southeast. They like to engage China and India, but they don't want to be, that's why China and India can never be members of ASEAN. They can be dialogue partners of ASEAN, but never members of ASEAN. And uh, 
Uh, the Cold War is ended, but there is a kind of a new Cold War happening between the US and China. And ASEAN doesn't want to be part of it either. I think genuinely, ASEAN countries do not want to take sides if they can. They can avoid it in the, in the, in the competition between US and China. They do not want to take sides unless they're forced to. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's really been ASEAN's policy. That's been actually Indonesia's policy. So that will be my, my answer. I mean, it's a long-winded way of saying why I think ASEAN, the economic strategy that you are suggesting for ASEAN um, may or may not work. And uh, one more thing, by the way, India has done very well in the IT sector, but partly because it has access to the American consumers. I mean, in the pro IT, the call centers uh, from India, if they didn't have access to the American uh, market, uh, I don't think they will go very far. And uh, this is why every time pe the Congress, people in the Congress say, oh, the Indian you know, call centers are taking away business for Americans, uh, it's a very sensitive thing for Indians. Uh, the United States still provides the largest market access for this high-tech products of Southeast Asia. And uh, which is why ASEAN is right to think of United States as part of the economic region. I would not see this as a colonization. Uh, this is not 19th century colonialism, when uh, the British and the French came in, took the raw materials, and killed off your domestic manufacturing, and used you as a destination for their exports. Even China cannot do that. You know, some of you remember in the 1980s and 90s, uh, fear that Southeast Asia, ASEAN, is becoming like a periphery of China. So China is getting natural resources and exporting finished products. Far from it. There were a lot of investment diversion from ASEAN to China. That is true. But Southeast Asia did not become an economic appendage of China. Why? Because Southeast Asia already had a manufacturing base. And if you look at the composition of ASEAN-China trade, it's not like China was only importing uh, coal and uh, uh, rice or uh, uh, you know, iron ore from ASEAN. In fact, China is importing more iron ore from Australia than from any ASEAN country. Uh, and <coughs> ASEAN is only receiving Chinese finished products. The reality is, that ASEAN also exports a lot of electrical goods, machinery tool, machine tools uh, to China, which are not raw material or resources. And of course, China exports a lot of stuff to ASEAN, but these are not really Chinese exports. These are things manufactured by Western multinationals in China, or Taiwanese or uh, Japanese multinationals in China. This is not 19th century trade, uh, and, and, and which is why ASEAN is actually wise not to push this internal economic integration too far. Because it depends on these wider markets. It depends on ASEAN's relationship with China, India, Japan, United States, and the European Union are still extremely important. But what the ASEAN economic community will do creates a psychological cushion. There are three communities, political security community, economic community, Sociocultural community is all very nice and neat. It adds kind of ballast, cushion. And that's good. But it's not a substitute for ASEAN's participation in global trade. Thank you, professors. Do we have some more questions? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Aisa Ang. I'm from Smart Communications. My question comes in three parts. First, what is the impact of economic integration on duopolies like the local telco industry and oligopolies? Second, how will economic integration be better or worse for the consumers of such um, duopolies and oligopolies? And uh, third, how will this integration change the business sector's relationship with whichever ruling government party. Thank you. 
I think if this is your this is your question. Uh, I, I wasn't able to take notes as fast, Isa. So can you repeat your you second repeat? and third questions? Yes, certainly, Professor Maharanes. My first question is, how will economic integration impact the Wobblies like the local telco industry? Okay. The second question is, how will such integration be better or worse for the consumers of oligopolies and duopolies? We okay. keep in mind the same industries, even um, energy, water. Mm -hmm. And my third question is, how will this change the business sector's relationship with okay. the ruling government party? It may be okay. the current president or whoever will win in the next election. Okay. Uh, on the first, uh, ASEAN is faced with this massive problem of what we call competition law. The Philippines is embarking on a fair competition law sometime before the year ends. Our Senate President, Franklin Drillon, announced at the Management Association of the Philippines meeting last week that a priority agenda is for the uh, fair competition law to be legislated in anticipation of ASEAN integration. What will this contain? This will contain the rules and regulations prohibiting unfair trade practices so that the size of the company will matter less. It is not size that matters today in anti-competition. What matters is whether you are open to a challenge from outside. Let's say there are only two players in the telco in the Philippines. But if it's open to a challenge by another Singaporean or Thai company, then it's deemed as competitive. What will be deemed as an anti-competitive is if the two players will prevent the entry of a foreigner in making sure that the services are purely with the hands of the existing players. So the fact that your competitive challenger can come from another country might mean the advantage is more sophisticated technology, costs that are lower to the consumers so that the consumers benefit in the end. And indeed, this is what political leaders would like, cheaper communication costs. For example, in a country, you can compare data with that of the dialogue partners. What does it take to purchase certain types of plans for your cellular services. Uh, I think it's very clear that we can learn from many of these dialogue partners. In other places, the telcos give away the cell phones for free. And in other places, the terms of engagement of the customer and the telcos are quite different. So will ASEAN and the Philippines take the Fair Competition Act as a way of addressing the consumer welfare, which is at the heart of the new regulatory thinking uh, elsewhere in the world, like in the EU and in the United States. So to me, it's very clear that the openness of our duopolies and our uh, business giants to competition is key to whether indeed the fair competition rules and theories will apply to them in the near uh, integration period. The longer uh, term problem, therefore, is whether indeed these duopolies in the Philippines will become duopolies in ASEAN. And that's exactly the logic of a single production base. Yes, you might be a duopoly in the Philippines, but if you are challenged by the Singaporeans and the Thais, you will be small players, provided the Singaporeans and the Thais can offer the same service in the Philippines. And the Filipinos may opt to get the service of the telcos from Singapore and Thailand. So that's opening. And this is the reality of fair competition. And this is what the public, the Philippine public, has to be more uh, uh, informed about. Yeah. Because there has been little discussion on things like this. And I thank Ms. Isa Ang for raising the issue because there must be more uh, uh, informed uh, discussion on these matters. 
And I believe we have one more question from the same side. Yes. Good day, Professor. I'm Paolo Francesco from the Asian Institute of Management. Um, a lot of us come here with questions about the ASEAN Economic Community 2015. Uh, and for many months now, we've been receiving different kinds of perspectives from people who underplay, who, who downplay rather the ASEAN Economic Community 2015, other people that hype it up. We don't know exactly how to feel about it. Um, but in your perspective, how important is the success of this AEC 2015 to the continuance of ASEAN as being a credible institution or organization in the world? Okay, I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, the expectations of the international community on AEC is low. Um, that's what being in Washington, we have a lot of these meetings on AEC, ASEAN, and people have accepted the fact that there will be an AEC in, in name, it, there may be an AEC in the substance by 2025, but it's not going to happen in 2015. So because the expectations have been lowered, I don't think there'll be a lot of damage. It'll say, okay, I mean, it's, it's going to be delays. There is still uh, pro uh, protectionism, and uh, there's still going to be holdouts uh, in different sectors. Uh, and I think the, the, the reports, uh, evaluations that I have seen uh, actually differ. There is a very uh, kind of pessimistic evaluation coming from the Asian Development Bank. And actually, I was there yesterday, and they gave me their report. They, they think, among other things, uh, even though, um, first of all, a lot of business doesn't know about the AEC. And they're not taking advantage of uh, the tariff preferences. But what was striking to me is that in some cases, customs officials are actually not aware of tariff concessions and, and, the, and the trade on the border. Actually, they are charging tariffs, uh, which is uh, something I didn't know about. And uh, then there are, of course, questions about re domestic national regulation. You can remove tariffs, but domestic regulation which is imposed by your national government and non-tariff barriers are difficult to overcome. So nobody really thinks it's going to be a true community uh, in that sense. And uh, in one sense also, the movement of uh, labor. Uh, well, you know, when we talk about an economic community, I mean, going back to theory, an economic community is supposed to allow free movement of labor capital and, uh, and goods. Well, can you think of uh, like a somebody from Vietnam or Philippines getting a job in uh, uh, Singapore easily as, uh, say, a French can get a job in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think free movement of labor is going to be difficult, take a long time, uh, because of different levels of development and uh, different levels of education and skill base in different countries. So. What, what, what does it mean? That means the ASEAN economic community is a failure? No. And I have seen another report, uh, which was commissioned by the Econ Economist uh, Corporate Network, which is actually quite positive. And it's, it, it's, it says that I have that report in my computer, that actually more and more people are becoming aware. As the date nears, and we have seminars and conferences, the business is becoming more aware of the ASEAN economic community. It talks about the fact that uh, I said earlier about the movement of uh, people across ASEAN borders. Well, actually, uh, the, the statistics I gave you is slightly wrong. It was from 16 million to 37 million, not 11. 16 million in 2000 to 37 million today, uh, in 2011. That's the lot of small farms, which are basically part of this movement. People are aware of. Uh, so there is something called ASEAN uh, economic community, although most of the sources of information are still from governments rather than from uh, businesses' own networks or, uh, or from a civil society or think tank groups. But I think that the Economist Corporate Network report is much more positive, and, uh, and uh, big multinational companies are taking paying attention. Uh, and attention is part of the 
the advantage of having an economic immunity? So the answer is that it's too soon to call the ASEAN economic community a success. 2015 is not the year when ASEAN economic community will actually happen. It will happen in theory, but not in practice. But it will happen one day. I will, maybe another five years, or maybe 10 years, and, uh, and I think the trajectory is good. But my overall sense is that even if it happens, ASEAN still has to be part of a larger regional and global economy. It still has to have the need for strong time. You should still be looking at markets in China, markets in India, markets in, uh, the, in the West. Uh, I don't think the ASEAN economic community can be technologically self-sufficient. So, so, so looking for opportunities, I mean, India is now opening up a little bit more. Uh, China is, of course, already a little saturated, but still looking for those opportunities are going to be still very important. And uh, by the way, another thing that is uh, helping is the single window, ASEAN investment, uh, single window area. Foreign companies are taking notice that you need to set it, fill in one set of forms uh, for all the ASEAN countries if you want to move your goods uh, across the border rather than every time you move to a country, you fill in a new set of forms. Those things are helping, uh, helping ASEAN. The services sector integration has been lacking, but I think there is a greater awareness that the ASEAN economic community is uh, happening, is a good generally taken as a positive thing, but nobody thinks it's going to be completed next year uh, as uh, the official deadline looms. Maybe uh, Professor McCarnas, you, you know a lot more about this. On, on, on which 